Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Welcome to Sunday School again. Well, we have a subject today that is a my it is a subject and uh, one that we we've all uh, dealt with and deal with uh, on a, on a daily basis, but one that we now have help. Uh, we're, we're no longer uh, bound by this enemy that we're going to talk about today that uh, has caused men and women around the world to do things that they did not want to do. Uh, has caused relationships to be destroyed, uh, has caused a lot of problems uh, uh, on the job, in the home, in the businesses. This subject today, we, we want to thank God that we've been freed from sin. And so that is a, that's going to be our subject, subject today, this morning, freedom from sin. My name is Ricky Pitts, and I'll be your Sunday school teacher. Uh, I'm teaching on behalf of True Deliverance. Holiness Church, where Bishop Nolan T. Torbert is the pastor, the founder, and the overseer. So without any further ado, we're going to go right ahead and get started here. And this, because this is a very good lesson. Again, freedom from sin. And I'm going to put, I'm going to put it on the screen, so I want you to, to see what we're going to be talking about from time to time. I won't uh, do the whole lesson this way, but uh, quite a bit. 
Again, Romans 6, uh, verses 1 through 14. There's a lot, it's quite a few verses today, and we might not get finished today. I'm not sure, but we're going to do the very best that we can to get through it all. I want to open up with about with a three, three different questions here to make us think about the lesson as we go through it uh, today. One is, can you live a holy lifestyle without God's work in your rebirth? Rebirth. Number two, how do you balance a natural fear of death with your faith that death no longer has dominion over you? That's a big question right there. So when you got to really think about that one. Number three is what spiritual resources can you employ to fortify yourself against sin? Now, with that being said, we're going to jump right on in. The first part of our lesson, the first five verses is talking about being dead to sin. And we see here that Paul is going to ask a rhetorical question. The first one is, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Then the second part of that, of that um, part number two is an emphatic answer. Paul says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And the third verse, know ye not? that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ was baptized unto his death. Now, I'm going to kind of give a little commentary on that, then we'll come back uh, in a moment and go through the rest of it. But um, I think it's important that we realize and we, we really understand uh, some of the things that Paul is talking about here, and it's relatively deep. So deep to where we're not going to, again, have time to get into every part of it. But I'm going to just cover now some of the commentary on verse 1 on the rhetorical question. We see here that Paul is what they call priming the reader. Uh, for his answer to the question, shall we continue in sin? And we see in the question a, a, a kind of flow, logical flow, a logical course. And the first one, number one is forgiveness of sin is a sign of God's grace to us. Well, that makes sense. But look how this thing is going to progress in the mind of many people. Number two, grace is a good thing. Well, that makes a lot of sense. But here's where it, has, it leaves the road in the mind of a lot of people. Why not sin so, we can, so that we can get more grace from God? Now what, you see, well, let me move on. In verse 2, Paul is using what the commentary calls a technique that, that's reduction to the absurd. Reduces it to, this is really crazy, the way y'all are thinking here. Anyone who uh, is going to put up an argument that to continue in sin, sin continuation is a good thing, because it gives God a lot more opportunities to forgive us and to show us more grace, has completely left the road. They've missed the entire lesson. The mind has went to a whole other way of interpreting uh, of interpretation uh, because folk, folks can do what they want to do and they try and justify it. Well, well this is a, did you read the Bible? With no research, no study. In verse 3, this Roman audience wasn't really familiar with the concept of being baptized into Jesus' death. What do you mean baptized into Jesus' death? Baptism was commonly understood as a ritual and a way for washing, washing away sins. And John, John clearly and explicitly uh, linked this. To, to genuine repentance, you really, you really are sorry for the for what you've done. You really are godly sorrow, sorry for the life that you've lived. And so John linked. I want you to read St. Matthew chapter three, verse one and two, then verse six and verse eleven. 
and Luke chapter 3 and verse 3. Now, as time went on and the Christian understanding um, grew, baptism was tied to faith, but faith in Jesus and also the gift of the Holy Ghost. I want you to read Acts chapter 19, the first five verses, and Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, and Titus chapter 3, verse 5, and 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. So Paul then, Paul also connected baptism to a personal ID. It's like another identification. Baptism is a personal identification of the believer with Christ. So I went down in Jesus' name. I was emerged as an, as an ID uh, or a way of identifying myself with Christ. The believer in Christ, the identification process is what Paul, it's how Paul connected baptism. I want you to read Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. Now, I'm going to pull something else up that I want you to look at. Let's look at verses 4 and 5 here. I tell you what, I gotta get a, I gotta get another system uh, with this technology here because this stopping and starting is uh, is a long ways around the mountain. Here we go. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, let me bring, let me, I got to get me two cameras. So I'll have to keep twisting back and forward here. But until then, y'all got to bear with me. All right. So let, let, let's take a look at here now some of our commentary. In verse four and five, we see that baptism is a fitting analogy for death, as the body, as a dead body is, is buried in the ground when the person, you go to a home going service, uh, they don't leave the body right there in front of it, they, they bury the body in the ground. Christians are lured into the water of baptism to symbolize that they're dead to sin. And while under the water, uh, we learned in our commentary that the normal sensory perception that perception, they are suspended. The natural way of thinking, what are we doing here? I'm just going down, you know, hear folks say going down a dry devil and coming up a wet devil. Well, if they don't convert their thinking, can convert their mind, I can, I, I, I can see your point here. But when we are born again and when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, we commit to him, we commit to what he did for us, the death, burial, and resurrection, we believe that he died. We believe that he was buried. We believe he rose again the third day to cover our sin. Something takes place during that belief, during that faith in the process. So by, by baptism, we are brought into Christ and, and that his death becomes our death. His death becomes our death, spiritually speaking. So baptism then puts, puts sin to death. Baptism puts sins to death and it buries, buries it. And the process, here's what the process is. Repentance, baptism, belief. You know, um, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter said, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, forgiveness of your sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I want you, by, by the way, read Acts 2.38. I want you to read also Coloss Colossians chapter 2 and also verse 12. Jesus, Jesus died. and I, We all are uh, uh, clear on that. He died, but he also rose again. He was raised to life by his father. And in the same way, our death in Christ is not the end, but the means of beginning a new life. So baptism then symbolizes the end of the old life of sin and the beginning of a new life. I'd like you to read Romans chapter 8, verse 6 and 7, and also verse 11. 
So Paul says, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So Christian baptism then is a reenactment, a reenactment of the central facts, the core facts of the gospel message. What are the central and core facts of the gospel message? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those are the, those are the central facts of, our, of, the, of the gospel message. This is why we are here. If he had not gotten up, we would not, I mean, we don't have, we don't have a leg to stand on if he had not gotten up. So baptism then is, is an opportunity. It's an opportunity. It's a, great, it's a great chance to be like Jesus. And I want you to read 1 Corinthians chapter, 5, chapter 15 and the first four verses to, uh, to bring more clarity to that point. Now, let me, let me pull us back up here, and I want you to look at something else here. Let's look at uh, the next part of this, uh, of the lesson, Alive in Christ. First part is freedom from sin, again. Verse 6 says, knowing, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, look at that, those three, those three words, now the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not, henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now let, let's do a little commentary on he that is dead is freed from sin. In verses 6 and 7, Paul is, going, is talking about here a battle. He's talking about a fight that's an ongoing fight. And that fight, that battle is between the spirit and that fight is between the flesh. And as long as we live in this place called the world, this old world is not our home. We all are pilgrims passing through. The enemy is going to tempt and he's going to entice that fleshly part of man. That fleshly part of man is the body. He's going to do that in an attempt to get rid of your faith, to erode the faith. But Paul goes on to teach that as a new man, we no longer take orders from the headquarters of sin. As a new man, we're born again. We have a new master as a new man. I want you to read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 through 24, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. So by joining with Christ, we no longer serve sin. By joining with Christ, we've been freed from sin and the ongoing controlling influence that sin brings. By being in Christ, we're not under that kind of bondage and those kind of chains and shackles anymore. And not only that, we now have the Holy Ghost. We now know that greater is he that is within us than he that's within the world. We have, we have help now. We got a paracletus. We have someone that walks with us and talks with us and someone that tells us that we are his own. And we're no longer controlled by the influence of sin anymore. I want you to read 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 4. Now I want to I wanna bring, out, bring out, let's read the next few verses and let's read those together. Let me pull this up real quick. I want you to see it. If you, just in case, you might not have your Bible along with you. Now, if we be dead, verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, died no more. Death had no more dominion over him. He ain't going to die. He's died one time. And he ain't going to die no more. Now, let's, let's do a little commentary on, on verses 8 and 9 here. In verse 8 and 9, Paul indicates something. He indicates that we haven't really and truly experienced the full effect of the resurrection. And, but, but with Jesus, what Jesus did on the cross by his death and his resurrection gives us all the confidence we need to trust 
that one day there's going to be a, there's going to be a great getting up morning. One day we're going to be resurrected at some point in time in the future. We don't know when we don't know where no man, no man knows the day or the hour. He's going to return back from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Everything that's alive and remaining going, going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Because he got up, we're going to get up. And we're going to share in that resurrection. And we've seen in history that there have been, there have been others that have been risen from the dead. You read about that in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17 through 24. You read about that with Lazarus also. Lazarus, Jesus wrote, he, got, he was in the grave. And the sister said, he's, he's thinking now, Lord. But he got up when the Lord called him to get up. You read about that in John chapter 11, verse 38 through 44. But the thing with, with these figures of history, they got up, but they died again. And but when Jesus was raised from the dead, he was raised to die no more. And every Christian, every Christian that faces death, they face death knowing that the, the death enemy, that enemy called death has been defeated. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And death then has no more dominion over him. Sin and death have been overturned and the new era has begun. And I, I'm kind of running out of time, but I want to read, I want to read something uh, for you real quick here. And I know we, we, we kind of short on time, but if you give me a minute here, I want to read what, what uh, Colossians, what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version. And he himself existed and, and is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. His is the controlling cohesive force of the universe. He is also the head, the life source and leader of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will occupy the space, the first place. He will stand supreme and preeminent in everything. For it pleased the Father for all the fullness of deity, the sum total of his essence, all his perfection, powers, and attributes to dwell permanently in him. This is in the Son. And that's a really big deal. You see, class, let me, uh, let, let's go on a little bit further in our, in our lesson here. And let's look at verses uh, 10 and 11. See, they're talking about freedom from sin. And let me pull, well, I'll tell you what, I'm still going back and forward. I want you to turn to it in your Bible if you don't have one uh, on your electronic device until I get two cameras so I'm not stopping and going and stopping. Verse 10 says, for in that he died, he died unto sin one time. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. In verse 11, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now in verse 10 and 11, we see that when Jesus died for our sins, it was enough. It was enough for all, etern for all times. I want you to read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24 through 28. In chapter 10, verse number 10. And he submitted to death. He submitted to death. And he, the death because there was the, death is, was the, is the consequence of sin. He didn't sin. But he submitted to death because we sin. And the wages of sin is death. But now he's on the right hand of God. And now he has uh, what he had laid down before. He laid down his glory in heaven. He laid aside his glory. Now he's back in the same, in the rightful place. And he, he laid aside his glory to live among us. I want you to read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, and Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8. And because of what Jesus did on Calvary's cross, all of us now are free from the slavery to sin. Because sin will make a, a child of God, a, yeah, a child of God, a slave. And we've been given the freedom to choose 
obedience to God now. We've been given the freedom to choose to do the right thing. And we have a new identity, a new identity in Christ. So, so we can now, we can live alive for God. And we can be alive to live for God. Even if we don't always feel that way. Even if we don't always feel that we're free from sin. Well, we, we, we've been made free from sin, whether you feel it or not. And it's important to walk in that newness of life, to, walk, to put on the new man and put, and put off the, to really put on the new man, like clothing, put on the new man. Now, let, let, don't you, let's read verses 12 and 13. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield, verse 13, your members, ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Oh boy. So in verse number 12 then, Paul urges his audience, he urges his readers not to allow the, 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 the sinister spiritual tyrant, the sinister spiritual enemy, that tyrant called sin, to exercise authority over our lives. Because sin will come in and, and bring a stronghold if we allow it, and sin would come in and exercise authority over the things we do, the things we say, the places we go, the thoughts we think, if we allow it. So we see here now that Paul ain't talking about some kind of philosophical, uh, logical sin. He ain't talk, talking about no, no kind of conceptual sin. Paul of the intellect. No, no, Paul is talking about real world, real acts of sin that involve the body. And those sins that involve the body spring from something. They come from yielding to the, to the, to the lust that sin brings. And sin has, a, has an array of lust uh, that, that can fit every fancy, uh, that can appeal to every man, woman, boy, and girl. He's saying just don't, don't yield to the lust of sin. And then, then but, but, but go on, we, we want to go on to make another point. By living under the rule of Christ, we've been given something. We've been given direction. We've been given a way out. We, we've, been, we've been given a path to flee from the clutches of sin, to flee from that stronghold that sin can bring in influencing the mind to do things that we know, we know, we, we're sure of, we should not go there. We should not say that. We should not do that. Uh, well, the, the, being under a new kingdom, in an, under a new king, in a new kingdom, it gives us a path to take. And then but by resisting sin, and resisting sin is not something that's real passive. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just hanging on. No, it ain't passive. Resisting sin requires intentionality. It requires intentional effort. We got to, we, we, hey, we got to do this on purpose to resist sin. And we must also choose now to abandon the sinful thoughts and to abandon the sinful behaviors. Somebody said, well, Ricky, that's more, that's more easier said than, than, than it is done. Well, we can't do it by ourselves. Ain't no doubt about that. But we have this paracletus. Y'all hear what I'm saying? We have the spirit of God. We have the one inside of us that raised up Jesus from the dead. And it quickens this mortal body. But at some day, at some point, this mortal is going to put on immortality. This corruptible at some point is going to put on incorruption. But that ain't happened yet. And while we're here on this place called earth, we got to Resist it with all we got in us. I want y'all to read 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22. In verse 13, we see that our body is no longer 
a possession of Satan. Not any longer. We learn this in verse 13. And that all parts of our body should be used, all parts of our body, as instruments for the purpose of God. We got we, we, we got to be we can't be conformed to this world. We got to be transformed uh, by the renewing of our mind that we can prove what's that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. The church now is in a space. The church is in, is in a place in a space between the resurrection and the rapture. The church lives in the middle. Resurrection here, rapture here. Church is in the middle. A body that's been, that's been born again, but still yet a body. Holy Ghost on the inside. Body, soul, and spirit. Spirit made perfect. Spirit being, spirit is perfectly, is sinless, but the body is still here. Dealing with everyday decisions and activities and, and temptations and enticements every day. And so in the meantime, in between time, we ought to live a life that the Lord requires. In the meantime, and in between time, we got to live a life that's, that's holy, acceptable, and pleasing to the Lord. I want you to read Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24. And we cannot, now we cannot live lives of divided loyalty. No more, than, no more than a woman can have two husbands, or a husband can have two wives, not in, at least not in the United, not in the, this country, Okay and serving two masters. We, we can't be partly alive and partly dead. Either we're dead or we're alive. Ain't no part, he, he half dead. No, ain't no half dead. He's a dead or he's alive. And we are completely alive now. Listen to this. We are alive from the dead. I want you to read Ephesians chapter two and verse five. We got to close this thing now. We got to bring it on home. Verse 14. In verse 14, we see that by allowing sin to reign and rule over us, we put ourselves back into slavery. Despite the freedom that God has already given us through Christ, we put ourselves back into slavery. And obeying the law, some, some folks, I'm just going to obey the law. Well, obeying the law to the best of our ability still does not allow us to master sin because the law don't have that power. Instead, we ought to be ruled by grace. Apart from grace, we listen to this. We cannot overcome the sinful desires of sin without the grace of God. We got to have the grace. And by grace are we saved. By grace, death has been destroyed. By grace, the hold of sin has been broken. And by grace, the law has been fulfilled, not through us, but through the perfect obedience of Jesus. When he died on the cross, when he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So if our motivation then is to serve the Lord, and I want to serve him all the days of my life, if our reason and our motives are pure, the behavior, the righteous behavior is going to follow naturally. Does that mean we're not going every now and then make a mistake? Hey, hey you, you, listen, we're living between, we live between the resurrection and the rapture. And it's still in this body. So yeah, but we, we're not going to live. We're not going to practice. We're not going intentionally. Yes, so I'm, well, I really, I'm going to go out here and, and, and do, do a little something because I'm covered under grace. No, we ain't going to do that. And listen, class, we are out of time. We'll see you next week at the same time, same place. Y'all have a great rest of the Sunday, a great weekend, and a great week. Take care.